Hey, it's Mark. Thanks for welcoming our church into your homes. We pray that we will all be blessed today by this worship service. We want to thank you for watching all of our videos. Please follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our channel on YouTube so you can be aware of what's going on, stay current with our content, and please continue to share our videos with family and friends. We really appreciate that. We also want to say thank you to people for reaching out and keeping in touch with one another through phone calls, emails, Facebook, texting. Thank you to people who have been making masks, buying groceries, and thank you, of course, for all your generous giving. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, there are actually words of Jesus in the book of Acts. And the words of Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35 are, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So thank you for all of our givers who are giving so generously during this time. Again, we thank you for joining us with this online service. Gather around with your family, and God bless you today. Thank you.
thank you for joining us again. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever tried to run away? When I was about seven or eight years old, I decided that it was time to uh, run away from home. I guess I was sick of home life. I wasn't happy with uh, the way things were going. I guess my parents didn't want to follow the rules of the eight-year-old, so I decided it was time to uh, take a hike. And I remember I got at least two houses away before I decided that I was just going to hang out at my neighbor's house for a little while and then I, would, I decided to go back home. And uh, almost all of us can relate to the story of a runaway and that's why I believe Jesus told the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. It's one of Jesus' most famous stories. We are continuing on in the story. We're in chapter 24. The chapter is called No Ordinary Man. You can find it on page 335. In your story Bible, it's the story of the prodigal son who ran away from home. And as we go through this chapter, calling Jesus no ordinary man, I want you to realize that Jesus was no ordinary teacher as well. When you go through this chapter, you'll read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And if you were to read through the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety, it would only require about 15 minutes of reading time. And even though it's only 15 minutes long, 2,000 years later, we're still learning more and more and trying to apply that sermon to our lives every day. In the Gospel of John, Jesus also shows that he's a great teacher by giving us seven I am statements to reveal who he is. He said, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate for the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the true vine. And personally, I love those I am statements of Jesus. So you've got the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, you have the I Am statements in the Gospel of John. In Mark's Gospel, we see Jesus teaching as well. In fact, we're going to read Mark chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and uh, listen to the uh, teaching of Jesus to see how it's described in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. Now, this is one thing we'll notice about Jesus' teaching. He taught them many things by parables. So we need to ask ourselves a few questions. Number one, what is a parable? The standby definition is that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And what's great about Mark's gospel is that the people were amazed at Jesus' miracles three times, but they were amazed at his teaching seven times. They were more amazed at the teaching of Jesus than the miracles of Jesus. Jesus was such an amazing teacher. He could rally a crowd of thousands of people without an email blast, without bulk mailers, and without social media. Thousands of people followed Jesus just to listen to him teach. Jesus is never called the healer. He's never called the miracle worker, but he is called the teacher again and again, over and over in the Gospels. The teacher, the teacher, the teacher. The Pharisees and Sadducees called him the teacher. The rich young ruler, the experts in the law called him the teacher. The disciples, Nicodemus, Mary and Martha, Andrew, James and John, they all called him the teacher. When Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to her, called her by her name Mary, and she said one word to Jesus. Rabboni, which means teacher. And the word teacher, or the title of teacher, was not used lightly in Jesus' day, but Jesus was called the teacher more than 30 times in the Gospels. So Jesus was no ordinary teacher. And when we come to Luke chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son, page 337 in your story Bible, when we come to that parable, when we come to that story, we need to remember that the Gospel of Luke is the Gospel of second chances. And that's what Luke 15 is all about, a second chance for all of us. So let's look at the first two verses of Luke 15 to get an idea of why these stories were told by Jesus. Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees muttered about all these sinners who were gathering around Jesus because the Pharisees like to keep themselves separated from people like that. That's what Pharisee means, separate. They wanted to remain separated from people like that. 
they didn't like these sinners and they didn't like Jesus because he welcomed sinners. They didn't like Jesus because he ate with sinners. And they didn't like Jesus because he was friends with those sinners. So this is going to be a teachable opportunity for Jesus to teach them something about grace, love, forgiveness, and about the Father. Jesus is going to share three stories in Luke 15. Two of those stories are not found in the other Gospels about items that were lost. Three stories about items that were lost. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The lost sheep. The shepherd loses one of his sheep. It wanders off. He leaves the 99 sheep on the hillside to go find the one lost sheep. And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and he takes it home and he calls his friends to celebrate and he throws a party. The next story, the second story, is the story of the lost coin. The woman has 10 coins and she loses one of them. She sweeps the house and lights a lamp until she can find the coin. And when she finds that coin, she calls her friends and has a party and she celebrates and parties because she has found her lost coin. Then Jesus is going to share one more parable with them, the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son. And let's read that parable in Luke 15, verses 11 and 12. We'll just read a couple verses at a time so we can really let the story sink in. It's a familiar story, but there's so much we can continue to learn from this parable that Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago. It's no ordinary story, and it did not come from an ordinary teacher. Jesus was an extraordinary teacher. So let's just do a few verses at a time. Luke 15, verses 11 and 12. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now it's interesting to me that the first person mentioned in the story is the father. So why do we overlook the father? Why do we call it the parable of the prodigal son? The story is about the father. The parable is about him. It's not about the runaway son who leaves home. It's not about the rebel son that we meet later on. The parable is about the father. Jesus mentions the father first, but there's trouble on the home front. The younger son, the baby, the second son says, dad, give me my share of the inheritance. So this young man is saying that he can't get along with his father. He hated the rules and the routines and the work that he had to do at home. He wanted to spend dad's money as he saw fit. Basically, he was telling his dad, you're better off dead to me because I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait till after you're gone. That's the scenario that Jesus has drawn us into. Let's go to verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this father, this dad that Jesus introduced to us first in the story, he's batting 500, I guess. One son ran away, one son has stayed home, he remained at home. The younger son, the baby, the second son, takes the money and he runs away. And he squandered his wealth in wild living. And I thought that's an interesting pronoun there. He squandered his wealth in wild living. It wasn't his wealth. He was living on dad's credit card. That, the, the money belonged to his father. It was his dad's wealth. And he squandered it in wild and wasteful living. He just wasted his father's money. The money ran out. I'm sure all of his friends ran out too at that point. And uh, bad becomes worse. The money is all gone. And then a famine hits, so there's no food. And he needs a job. So what job does he find? He ends up in a field feeding pigs, which is pretty disgusting. It would be very disgusting to a Jewish boy. It would have totally grossed out the Pharisees. They would consider it awful. Their stomachs would turn to hear of a young Jewish boy feeding pigs. In fact, they demonstrated the same disgust about feeding pigs towards the people that they considered sinners. They were disgusted 
by the sinners that Jesus was hanging out with as well. And he longed to fill his stomach with the food that the pigs were eating. Have you ever seen a slop bucket? Have you ever seen a pig's trough and felt hungry? That's how bad off this boy was. That pig slop looked appetizing to him. So think of his downhill descent. He leaves home, he runs out of money, he wasted all of dad's money, and he literally goes from feast to famine until he's at the very bottom feeding, ping, feeding pigs. He squandered his wealth. I just want you to think about this for a moment. Are you squandering the blessings that God has put into your life? Are you squandering the blessings that God has put into your life? This boy squandered everything that his father gave him. But fortunately, things are starting to look up. Luke 15, verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have, have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. I was reading a book that was very critical of the son. It said that he only went home because of his stomach. And uh, to me, that sounds like a Pharisee, very judgmental. I don't know why the son went home, but he came to his senses. He realized that he'd be far better off in his father's house than anywhere else. So he came to his senses. He is going to try to work his way back into the Father's good graces rather than rely on the Father's grace alone. He is going to try to work his way back into his Father's good graces rather than rely on the Father's grace alone. We need to remember that we can't work for, we can't attain or obtain or earn God's grace by what we do. The, the son realizes he can go home again. He rehearses his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He rehearses that speech over and over and over again on his journey home. And we need to realize that at this point of the parable, we need to remember an important lesson. You can always turn home. You can always turn home. You can always turn back to God. You can always turn home. Verse 20 is the key in my mind. Luke 15, verse 20. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now the father did not seek him out well, he was gone. He did not seek him out and invite him to come home. He did not seek him out and force him to come home. The father just waited patiently and stayed home. When the son decided to come home, he would find dad exactly where he left him. And when the father saw him, he was filled with compassion. His father ran to him. His father ran to him. Have you ever seen your father run? I never really saw my father run. It's unusual to see your father run. But what is the son thinking as the father is running towards him? Did he slow down and, you know, put himself on guard a little bit because his father is running at him, probably angry, probably ready to judge him, ready to condemn him, punish him, who knows what? Did the son slow down as the father ran toward him? But his father ran to him. He ran, the father ran to his barefoot son. An average father would run up to that child and lay down some new ground rules or demand an apology or wait till the son proved himself before he received any real blessings. But in Luke 15, we are not dealing with an average father. In Luke 15, we are not dealing with an average father. The father ran to him. The father ran to him, and in verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
The prodigal son came home and he considered himself a slave and not as a son. But the father accepted him as a son. The son couldn't fall to his knees and beg for forgiveness because the father was bear hugging him in his arms. The father said, quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his bare feet. The father clothed him, clothed him in the best robe that he had on the property. And when we wander from God, we're kind of like the prodigal son, barefoot, dressed in rags, falling apart. And the Old Testament says that that's how we look when we carry our sin around. In Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah 64, 6, it says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, dirty laundry, dirty rags. Our righteousness is just a bunch of dirty, nasty rags in the eyes of God. But we need to remember, you can always turn home. And when you turn home, when you turn back to God, God the Father will not clothe you in a robe, but he will clothe you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When we believe in Jesus Christ, when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you're not clothed in a robe, a physical robe. You are clothed in the spiritual righteousness of Jesus, which is what we are told in Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, we're slaves. We've run away. We're covered in filthy rags. But when you return home to God, he says, you're my child. And he clothes you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his son. When the prodigal son came home, he looked at his father and he said, I am not your son. I'm a slave now. And the father said back to him, you are not a slave. You will always be my son. The father said in verse 24, This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Remember those words, this son of mine. God will look at you and say, You are a son of mine. You are a daughter of mine. You are a child of mine. And uh, the party starts in verse 24 and doesn't stop. The party starts in verse 24 and doesn't stop. The father says, let's have a feast and celebrate. So they began to celebrate and the celebration continues to the very end of the parable. Now, if we stop there, if that was the end of the story, it would have a great happy ending. But the problem is the parables of Jesus were not written by Disney. They don't all have happy endings. So there are two things that did not celebrate in the story of the prodigal son. The fat calf, he didn't celebrate. And the older brother didn't celebrate. Watch his attitude. Watch his response in verses 25 through 30. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. But when this son of yours, excuse me, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The older brother was supposed to be the good kid, but really he's the prodigal son that never left, and he decides to throw his own pity party. The prodigal son felt like a slave, not a son, and the older brother sounds just the same way. He says, I've never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me a small party or a young calf to celebrate with my friends. He squanders everything and you have a celebration for him. So the younger son, excuse me, the older son, he feels like a slave too. He doesn't feel like a son. He feels like a slave that he's been slaving away at his father's house for nothing. The older brother couldn't acknowledge that his younger brother had returned in the same way that the Pharisees could not acknowledge that the sinners were turning to Jesus for redemption and forgiveness. And you have to ask yourself, is that us? Is that how we respond to people who walk through our church doors 
who are trying to find their way back to God? Are we as judgmental as the Pharisees? Are we judgmental like the older brother? When prodigal people are trying to find their way back to God, do we celebrate like the father or do we condemn them like the older brother? We need to make sure that we don't have the older brother syndrome. We need to remember that our church, every church, but specifically our church, the Christian Church at De Leon Springs, is for lost and broken people, not just people who are found and fixed. Our church is for lost and broken people, not just those who are found and fixed. I've already said that Jesus is no ordinary teacher. What made Jesus extraordinary was his use of role reversal in his teaching. Jesus would take a hero in society, use role reversal, and make him a villain. Then he would take a villain in society, use a role reversal, and make that villain a hero. If you heard Jesus tell a story, if you were there when Jesus told a story about a priest and a Levite and a Samaritan, you would immediately consider the priest and the Levites heroes, and you would consider the Samaritan a villain. But when Jesus finishes telling the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite are considered villains, and the Samaritan is exalted as a hero, the Good Samaritan. That phrase has even crept into our vocabulary. Everyone knows what a Good Samaritan is. Jesus explained what a Good Samaritan is in Luke chapter 10, in the story of the Good Samaritan. But Jesus takes a villain and makes him a hero. He does that here in Luke chapter 15. He does it in Luke 16 with a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus. The rich man becomes the villain. Lazarus becomes the hero. He does it in Luke 18 with the parable of the unjust judge. The judge becomes a villain. The poor widow becomes a hero. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, also in Luke 18. You'll find lots of parables in Luke 18 that you won't find anywhere else. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee would have been very admired by the people, but Jesus turns him into a villain. And the tax collector that people would despise becomes a hero because of the parable, the story that Jesus told. And in this story, at the end of the story, the hero in the story is the prodigal son who ran away and not the rebellious older son who complained to his father. Jesus does that role reversal thing where the villain becomes the hero and the hero becomes a villain. The runaway son became a hero. The older son who stayed home becomes a villain by the end of Jesus' story. Jesus' story was told. He told this story to show us the love and compassion and grace of God the Father. And our question should not be, do you know the story? Do you know the story of the prodigal son? That's not the question. Do you know the story? The real question is, do you know the Father? Do you know the Father? Don't say, I know the story. Let's talk about how we know the Father. The goal of Jesus' stories, the goal of the story of God, is for us to know him more, love him more, serve him more, and share him more. That's the goal of every story in the Bible, to know God more, to love him more, to serve him more, and to share him more. Every person, including you and me, every person listening to Jesus' parable has to look in the mirror and look at the characters in this story and pick one of them and say, that's me. We have to look at those characters, the older son and the younger son. We have to look into them like a mirror and say, that's me. Maybe you're like the rebel older son. Maybe you're like the runaway younger son. Look into the mirror of Luke 15 and ask yourself, which son looks like you? Which son do you look at and say, that's me? The Father gets the last word in Luke 15, Luke 15, verses 31 and 32. The Father says to his older son, who refuses to go to the party, My son, the Father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found What's interesting is that the older brother didn't refer to his sibling as a brother. He said, this son of yours. But the father said, 
This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The father wouldn't get him, let him get away with disowning his brother. He said, he's still your brother. This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Remember, at the beginning of the parable, Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. There was a father who had two sons. The parable is about the father. The parable is not about the sons. Both sons messed up. Both sons needed the compassion of the father. So what happened to the older brother? Did he stay at his pity party? Or did he join the celebration and the festivities for his younger brother? The father invited the son to participate in the celebration. The son had to decide. It was up to him. By leaving the story unfinished, Jesus left the door wide open. He left the door wide open. Did the older brother refuse to go in? Or did he join the party and celebrate with his younger brother and with his father? You can always turn home. That's what Luke 15 is about. The compassion of our Heavenly Father. You can always turn home. If you're like the runaway younger son, you can come on home. If you're like the rebellious older brother, you can come join the party. You can always turn home. Jesus left the door in the parable open for you as well. You can always turn home. The door is open for you. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the stories of Jesus. We thank you for the story of the prodigal son. Help us to look into the mirror of Luke 15 and help us to determine which son resembles ourselves. But most importantly, help us to look into Luke 15 and look at that Father and realize that it is our Father God who has compassion for us, runs to us, kisses us, welcomes us, loves us, and says they were dead, but they're alive, they're lost, they were lost, but now they're found. The Father in the parable, the Father in the story, is our Heavenly Father. And we thank you for revealing our Heavenly Father to us, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.